A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Stephen, filled with grace and power, was working great wonders and signs among the people. Certain members of the so-called synagogue of freedmen, Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and people from Sicilia and Asia came forward and debated with Stephen, but they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit within which he spoke. Then they instigated some men to say, we have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders, and the scribes, accosted him, seized him, and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They presented false witnesses who testified, this man never stops saying these things against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him claim that this Jesus, the Nazarene, will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. All those who sat in the Sanhedrin looked intently at him and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Verbum Domini Blessed are they who follow the law of the Lord. Though princes meet and talk against me, your servant meditates on your statutes. Yes, your decrees are my delight. They are my counselors. I declared my ways and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts and I will meditate on your wondrous deeds. Remove from me the way of falsehood, and favor me with your law, the way of truth I have chosen. I have set your ordinances before me. Dominus Fabiscum, Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Johannem, After Jesus had fed the 5,000 men, his disciples saw him walking on the sea. The next day, the crowd that remained across the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not gone along with his disciples in the boat, but only his disciples had left. Other boats came from Tiberias, near the place where they had eaten the bread, when the Lord gave thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal, 
So they said to him, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in the one he sent. Verbum Domini. This week we are going through John chapter 6, and as many theologians tell us, Pope Benedict reflected beautifully on this, these passages in his books. It's a very dense chapter of scripture, a lot of allusions to other parts of scriptures and a lot of layered meanings. And it's a continuation of this beautiful call to faith that John issues in his gospel. We know in John chapter 1, verse 12, we're told clearly, but to those who did accept him, accept Jesus, he gave power to become children to those who believe in him. Power to become children of God through faith. In John chapter 2, at the wedding feast of Cana, the Lord works this incredible miracle of turning the water into wine. And we're told this is the first of his signs and that the, his disciples began to believe in him. And then there's the cleansing of the temple. And at the end of that scene, we're told, and they came to believe the scriptures and the word Jesus had spoken. John chapter three in his conversation with Nicodemus culminates in, he says, and just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must the son of man be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. So that everyone who believes in him uh, might not perish, but might have eternal life, John 3.15, a little bit uh, also in John chapter 3. So there's this faith that affects this transformation us to become children of God that gives us eternal life, divine life. John chapter 4, his beautiful uh, interchange with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, he tells her, you know, that she has five husbands. And it so impresses her that he knows her deeply. And she goes back to the Samaritan town to witness to him. And we're told that many of the Samaritans of that town began to believe in him because of the word the woman who testified, he told me everything I have done. And many came to believe in him because of his word. We're told at the end of that passage. And then in John chapter five, verse 17, he says, my father is at work until now, so I am at work. He cures the man on the mat who was on the mat for 38 years and speaks about his father and he are at work together or his father working through him these great signs. These are all signs that Jesus performs that point to his divinity, that he's not just a teacher, he's not just a, a philosopher, but he is the son of God and we're called to have faith in him as divine. His works are signs. His works are signs that the Father is working in him, that he is truly divine. So whoever hears my word and believes in the one who sent me has eternal life and will not come to condemnation, but has passed from death to life. So these signs point to Jesus that we may have the fullness of life in him through faith. So that's all a setup um, for John chapter six. And at the end of John five, he says, you know, if you had believed Moses, you would believe me. That if you had faith in the revelation of the old covenant of the law, a true vibrant faith there that was sincere and recognized what Moses was giving you, you would recognize me and my call to believe in me as the, the son of God. So. With that background, John 6, as we heard the other day, begins with the multiplication of the loaves. So he's saying there's a continuity here, that if you accepted this earlier revelation of God accept me, so John 6 is full of allusions to Moses. We're told at the beginning that he crosses the sea. Moses crossed the Red Sea. Many disciples he crossed the sea to the other side and, and then he does this 
this uh, miracle, the multiplication of the loaves. And then many disciples followed him because they saw the signs he was performing on the sick. Many followed Moses right in the Exodus event out into the desert. We're told that Jesus goes up the mountain and sits down to teach them, right? He has a position of authority like Moses had. We have the references clearly in Matthew's gospel about the chair of Moses, the seat of Moses, this place of teaching authority. We're told in John 6 that Passover was near. Moses instituted at the command of God Passover to commemorate the Exodus event that formed them as a people. And this is all going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ that we become the people of God in him, in communion with him, formed as a people in his mystical body, the church. And then uh, right before the multiplication, he says, where can we buy food for them to eat? Jesus asks Philip. That's the same problem they had in the desert, right? How are we going to feed this crowd? The people were looking for a Messiah that fulfills Moses. They were to, he was to be a Moses-like prophet. In fact, they're told that clearly in Deuteronomy 18, that God will raise up a prophet like Moses for them. So the people get excited when they see these same signs that Moses performed. And they say this, truly, this truly, the prophet is the one who is to come into the world, a prophet like Moses. They see what Joseph, Jesus is doing. And second, Maccabees, we have this passage where Jeremiah is hiding the ark. Remember the ark, one of the things it contained was manna. And he says, Jeremiah, when he's hiding, and he says, the place shall be unknown until God gathers his people together again and shows his mercy. That there will be a reappearance, we could say, uh, of the manna. And certainly we see a fulfillment of the ark and Mary and Jesus. So the people see all this stuff, and maybe maybe especially the multiplication of the loaves. They were told in this previous passage, right, that they try to make him king. And he withdraws to the mountain alone. Why would he do that? Right? He says in the Synoptic Gospels he, you know, that the kingdom of God is underway. He acknowledges his kingship before Pilate. They're trying to make him king in a worldly sense, in a political sense, right? To drive out the Romans. But Jesus, as the Son of God, is offering us a deeper liberation. Right? You drive out the Romans, some other group's going to come in. That's a temporary fix, and God wants to give us something much greater than the best of this world. He wants to give us divine life, eternal life. So he doesn't allow himself to be made king in their vision, in their image, or in a worldly sense. He is the Son of God. He's going to give us a deeper freedom than what Moses offered in Exodus, right? A, a liberation from slavery. He's going to give us an exodus from sin and death. He's going to give us new life. So then he walks on the water, right? He withdraws to the mountain. The disciples go down to the boats, and they're crossing back to Capernaum. And he walks on the water, we heard, and he tells them, you know, I am. Do not be afraid. And they find themselves on the other side of the shore immediately. Again, this is the divine name revealed to Moses, again, at the, the burning bush. So he's trying to cultivate in them a belief in his divinity. Are they picking up what he is laying down? Are we picking it up, right? Do we get it in its fullest sense? They did not yet believe Jesus as the Son of God through these miraculous signs, right? Because they, they run along the shore and they say, they saw the disciples, they tell them, got into a boat, and they saw Jesus was not with the disciples. Master, how did you get here? They're still looking at the signs and things in a very worldly way. But they went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. Now these signs, as I said, are a call to faith. So they're hungry for something. They, they want more. And we see, I think, the gentleness 
how God works with us, that he tries to cultivate this in us, right? Tomorrow, we're going to hear about uh, that Jesus can satisfy us. He says, you know, they, they actually get to the point where they say, sir, give us this bread always, where he tells them that he is the true bread from heaven. They're still looking for this manna, this Moses-like miracle. He says he's the true bread. They say, sir, give us this bread always. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. He satisfies a deeper hunger than hunger for material bread and hunger, uh, thirst for water. It's a deeper spiritual hunger and thirst that we all have that will never be satisfied by the things of this world. In our culture, the Western world is a testimony of this. We have a consumerism and a materialism that's rampant, that's insatiable, that just demands more and more. I go to China Buffet here in town. You think I get one plate of food? I get one, one glass of iced tea? <laughs> no, right? We go back for more and more. We need, because we're body and spirit, we need a, a spiritual filling. We need God to come in. We have a God-shaped hole in us, as it's been said, and only he can fill it. So he is the true bread. God the Father through Moses gave the manna, which was still physical bread. He's going to give us the true bread, which is the bread of life, living bread, he says. And I'm just going to jump ahead to Friday's reading, 652, which is so powerful. He says, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. That Jesus is the one who satisfies us. He's going to come to us under the outward appearance of bread and wine, under the outward appearance of food, because he wants to satisfy us that we can only have life as we need natural food for natural life. We need him for this fullness of the spiritual life, of this divine life that he, he wants to give us. So he's building up with this call to faith in the first half of John 6, and then he's gonna give us an eloquent, very clear, repeated teachings on the Eucharist. That the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. That it truly is Jesus, and that he is the only one that can feed us, that can sustain us. As we need natural bread to exist for natural life, we need the Eucharist for the fullness of life. So he says, you know, they run along the shore in this passage today to find him, and he says, you know, you're coming to me not because of these signs that call to faith, but because you've eaten your, you've eaten your fill of the loaves. You're coming to me because it's time for breakfast, right? We had dinner last night. I'm trying to give you something more. He says, do not work for the food that perishes, but the, for the food that endures for eternal life. And, so, and they say, how do we work uh, for this? What, what's the work of God? And he says that you believe in the one he sent, that you have faith. And we all can get caught up in the work for the food that perishes in some way and push God aside. That's always a temptation for us. He's calling us to do this work of God as the Father wants to do this work in us, this call to faith. We believe by God's gift of faith to us. We cooperate with that faith, and we have to believe. So how do we do that? How do we cultivate this Eucharistic faith? First off is prayer. The church has beautiful celebrations of the Eucharist. We have ornate liturgies, we have beautiful music, we have Eucharistic processions, we have Eucharistic devotions. If you're struggling with belief in Jesus, with belief in his real presence, let yourself be carried by the, the devotions of the church. Let yourself be carried by the liturgies that she offers. Read good books on the Eucharist. Read John chapter 6, 
over and over and over again. I was reading stuff uh, in preparation for this and listening to some tapes and I, I was just hearing all these allusions to different parts of scripture I had never heard before. It's incredibly deep. God speaks to us in his word. It's the most powerful, I think, testimony to the Eucharist, even greater than the Eucharistic miracles that we have today. Read John 6. This is God's word to us, God speaking to us. It is true. Let it transform your mind and your heart. And then let your, put your body through the actions of faith. Go to adoration, kneel down, not in front of the TV, not in front of the football game, but in front of the tabernacle, in front of the Eucharist to receive faith. When we put our body through those motions, the mind follows. It transforms us. When we go to confession, to confess our sin before receiving the Eucharist, that builds our Eucharistic faith. When we have fellowship with other believers, when we ask them questions, we see their witness, hear their testimony of their faith in the Eucharist, the testimony of the saints, that helps us in our belief. When we take a Eucharistic holy hour, maybe there's an adoration chapel in your area and you can take an hour of prayer there to, to watch with Jesus. When we do works of charity, that enlivens our faith. Faith without works is dead. Our faith for it to be real, true, that we may adhere to Christ must be enlivened by charity, by the works of charity towards our neighbor. And the last one I would recommend would be, the church recommends, is evangelization. Bring somebody with you. Tell somebody else about your faith. In some way, share your faith. And when you see that person grow in faith, it inspires your own. There's a generosity to new believers that's a call upon all of us. I witnessed this in RCIA this year. Uh, to see their enthusiasm in things, it reminds me of how maybe the kingdom slip into second place in my own life at times. I see them excited to put, put the church, the church is teaching the Eucharist first. That ignites my own faith. So when we share it with others, we get something back. It helps our faith, our Eucharistic faith. Jesus wants to give us the fullness of life. That fullness of life is the gift of himself. He gives, it imitates the very processions of the Trinity, how they have this communion of persons giving themselves to each other. He's giving himself to us in a way that we can receive him bodily, the Eucharist, right, to transform us. Continues that dynamism of the Trinity in our lives. May we believe and help others to come to a deeper faith in Christ as well.